Christ and all, welcome back. This video is going out on St. David's Day, as you can tell from my daffodil. That means one of two things. One, I have stolen a flower from a public park, and two, it is the perfect day for us to talk about the namesake for this channel, Welsh Vikings. A lot of people ask me, were there actually Welsh Vikings? Were there Vikings who came from Wales? And the simple, quick answer to that is, we don't know. But, there is something that we do know that is usually completely forgotten about when we talk about the Vikings in Britain. People always talk about, on websites and in books, three things. The Danelaw, the Kingdom of the Isles, and Ireland. These are the three big parts of Britain that you'll normally hear about when people discuss the Vikings and their activities in Britain. It's important to remember that the Vikings covered basically the whole of Britain. They influenced the entire coastline. They didn't just get to Dublin and then go, ah, you know what lads, probably time to go home, and then go all the way back round Scotland. They raided the coast of Wales, they settled in Wales, and that's what we're going to talk about today. How is there a fly in this? How is there a living fly in this? There is a fly in my beer that is alive. How the hell am I going to get you out of there? Can I get you out of there? I'm going to try, buddy. I'm going to try. Come here. Come here, sunshine. Oh, damn, this surface tension. So close to being rescued. Wait. Stay there. Hold on, friend. I'm coming to get you. I'm coming to get you. Oh! Got you, mate. You alive? You are alive. Well done, my friend. Grip it. Grip it. Stay there, my friend. You take it easy. Okay. Now that I've successfully rescued a, like a fruit fly, wait, 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 I've completely forgotten what we're talking about now. We're going to be talking about the Norse influence and the Viking influence in Wales. So the three main things that most books and websites talk about and videos when they talk about the Vikings in Britain is they talk about the Danelaw, they talk about the islands, the Kingdom of Man and the Isles, which incorporates things like the Isle of Man and the Western Isles of Scotland, and they'll talk about the Hiberno-Norse, the Irish Vikings, okay? So, yes, when the Vikings first come to Britain at the end of the 8th century, the first place that they hit and raid is the northeast coast of England. They then start settling, and they settle the east coast of England, they settle in parts of Scotland, they settle the islands around the coast of Scotland, and then they settle very quickly after this in Dublin and have an enormous cultural influence on Ireland and the art and art uh, and artistic practice in Ireland in that time. So what the heck happens to Wales? Why do they not bother with Wales? Everybody kind of assumes at this point that they just didn't bother to go to Wales, but that doesn't make any sense. Wales has lots of natural resources, lots of timber, it has gold, it has metals, it has land, it has animals, it has lots of grain, especially in Anglesey. Wales has lots of easily defendable safe harbours. It makes perfect sense for the Vikings, a sea-based raiding profession, to use Wales. So why didn't they? The answer is, they did. There's not as much evidence in Wales of Viking Age interaction between the Norse and the natives, but we do know a few things about the relationship that they had. In the 850s, we know that the Norse the Vikings effectively allied themselves with Brittany, which is now part of northwest France, but at the time was a Britonic area. It spoke effectively Welsh. Same goes for Cornwall and Wales, they all spoke effectively the same language. After this, we get some evidence that Welsh kings on Anglesey and elsewhere were giving land to the Norse. They were giving Norwegian Vikings land. So it seems that in the 9th century, the Britons have a bit less of a... a little bit less of a um, confrontational relationship with the Norse than, say, the Anglo-Saxons over in the Danelaw, or the Anglo-Scandinavians down in Wessex, although, again, their relationship is less fraught. We do have later sources as well from the Icelandic sagas and from a 16th century Irish manuscript called the Annals of Loch care. Um, editing Jimmy, please write that on the screen. And apologies to any Gaelic speakers if I have horribly butchered that. Um, which describes 
Norse, Vikings, Norwegians and Danes marrying Welsh princesses and gaining land in Wales as a result. Some of these are in the 11th century, some of them are earlier, some of them are a bit later. We don't really know the veracity of this, we don't know if this is all true, if it's all complete bollocks, or if it's a mixture of the two. Probably a mixture of the two, just like everything else in the sagas. But what we do get good information from is, of course, because it's my channel, the archaeology. So the archaeology of the Vikings in Wales is really, really exciting. It's really, really good archaeology. On Anglesey, there is a village called Llanbedr Goch, the Red Parish of St. Peter, or the Parish of St. Peter the Red. It's in the east of Anglesey, it's near a beach, a relatively safe haven of a bay. It's now a holiday destination for some people, some poor, unfortunate people. And in Llanbedr Goch, we have a really, really interesting Viking Age site, which has very, very good evidence of a significant Norse presence in the east of Anglesey. And this Norse presence has things like rectilinear buildings, Norse-style decoration on Norse-shaped knives, jewellery, coin hoards. We have a manufacturing quarter, a domestic quarter. It seems like more than just a way station. It seems like a settlement, possibly used as a way station as well for ships and boats trading between for example, the Wirral, where there was a massive Viking presence, and Dublin and the Isle of Man. Anglesey makes a perfect little triangle. It's really useful to stop off on the way to Ireland. It doesn't involve you going all the way up northwest to the Isle of Man. It makes sense as a staging post. But we also have significant Viking Age crosses from Penmon, again in East Anglesey. In fact, there was a battle there in 1098 between the Normans, the Norwegians, and their Welsh allies in which the Norwegians effectively get Anglesey back from the Normans and then just let the Welsh keep it, which is amazing. Uh, I think it's also it's called the Battle of Anglesey Sound, or the Battle of the Six Ships. Penmon and Bangor, where I'm from, has Norse-style carvings on crosses and other carved stones. We also have a single hogback grave from the south coast of Anglesey on the Menai Straits, which is a tidal, effectively a tidal inlet that cuts the mainland off from Anglesey. So it's a really important tactical piece of water. It's a really important strategic waterway. So we have evidence that the Vikings were living and dying as pagans and as Christians in North Wales. We have coin hordes from Bangor. We have uh, settlements down in place. I mean, we have Viking settlement names from Wales. Galore, all over the place. Anglesey, Bardsey, Skerry, Skoma. Um, the other one, what's it called? That other island. Goat, Goatland, Goat Island. It's called Goat Island, I can't remember the name of it, it's off the South, Wales, South Wales coast. Swansea, Fishguard, Temby, Chirk, Milford Haven. All of these places have Norse toponyms. The toponymy of Wales has lots of Old Norse in it. Not just because the Vikings had a look at it from the sea as they were sailing past on their way to Brittany, but because the Vikings did settle in Wales. Not as much as they settled in Ireland or in the east of England, but they did settle there. And combining the diplomatic relationship between many of the Welsh petty kingdoms, the archaeology that we have, which is plentiful, that there were Norsemen living in Wales, and also the fact that we may have a ship from Swansea, a Viking ship from around AD 900 that we may have from Swansea, which is insane, there were Vikings in Wales. Did they use any of these places as bases of operation for raiding places in Ireland or the continent? I don't know. Did they use this as a highway from the Kingdom of the Isles down the coast of France so that they could get to the rest of Europe? I don't know. We don't know that yet. There's no possible way for us to know that. We do have coin hoards and jewellery hoards that suggests that quite a lot of trading was happening in Wales. We have a couple of coin hoards from Bangor. We have coin hoards from all over the west coast of Wales. We have raiding sites. We know that Powys was raided in 852 AD. And then we also have these settlement sites like Llanbedr Goch, which is so exciting. It's so cool that we have a Viking town on Anglesey. That's amazing. Really, really exciting for people like me. Maybe we'll do a Viking reenactment event on Anglesey one day. Wouldn't that be cool? You're all invited. So, the Vikings in Wales. 
that's one thing. But what about Welsh Vikings? Well, the problem there is we don't know how their recruitment worked. We know that in Scandinavia originally many of these... Ooh, my flower's gone wonky. Many of these people were probably family groups. It was probably, you know, Uncle Sven and his nephews, Lars, Lars and Lars, decide that they want to go off raiding. They have access to a boat. They fill the boat with supplies. They go off, they raid. Or your local Jarl says, right, I need two tons of gold. Go over to England, get me two tons of gold, and you can keep 10% of it. Sign a contract, off you go. Like, a, you know, any other kind of piratical culture, there were different ways of doing it. But what about losses? And what about if you, a Viking, settle on land that is given to you and your shipmates by a king? You're not raiding that land, you're given that land. Or what if you're third generation, and you've married into the local people. You've married into Welsh people from the kingdom of I mean, Morn, Gwynedd. What if your brother-in-law is a Gwynedd'r and you happen to have a couple of spaces on the boat and you need a crewman and your brother-in-law is an excellent sailor because he is a fisherman and is pretty decent with a spear and shield? I mean, it's plausible. It's highly plausible. It's probable, in my opinion, that local people, friendly natives, were recruited for raiding parties. We know that raiding parties could be quite big, they could number in the hundreds, and if you need to recruit people, and it's an appealing adventure, it seems likely to me that some local people would get involved. And we know that they weren't insular. We know that they actually did engage with the local populations in the place they lived in. They didn't just build a fence around their house like you do on Valheim and throw stones at the people coming up to the fence and bugger off, we're Vikings, leave us alone. No, they traded and they intermarried and they farmed and they sold things with the local people. We know they did that. So... Uh, were there Welsh Vikings? We don't know. We'll probably never know, unless we get a carved stone that says, Here lies David, the son of Sven, a Viking. We'll never know. Do I think it's probable that there were Welsh Vikings? Yes, I do, quite honestly. We know that Viking was a profession rather than an ethnicity, so there's nothing anywhere that says you can't go a Viking if you're not from Scandinavia. If you're with Scandinavians, on a ship's crew, doing a raid, that kind of makes you a Viking. Obviously a lot of this is speculative, a lot of this is conjectural, but what I'm really excited about when I talk about all of this is the sheer amount of archaeology that we have in Wales from the Viking Age that people just don't know about. So I'm linking in the description to the National Museum of Wales because their, digitali their digitised collection online has some incredible artefacts that I think really deserve more attention. Things like this sword and this penannular brooch. They're just wonderful things that I think we need to look at more. And because today is Didgwil Dewi, today is St. David's Day, I want you all to go and look at some Welsh Viking Age artefacts and enjoy them and appreciate my wonderful country's wonderful culture. So this week's phrase, Jimmy's phrase of the week in Welsh is Didgwil Dewi Hapis i Baub. Happy St. David's Day, everybody. Until the next time, Tana Tronessa. Who will I'm a tro? Bye for now. Oh, oh, lovely. Oh, I've got pollen all over my trousers. How's that fruit fly? Oh, he's gone. He gone. Yes. How to save a life. Go, fruit fly, go. He's not my beer again, is he?